This week on ANN, the 2018 autumn meetings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's Executive Committee begin. After more than five hours of presentation and discussion, delegates approve a document on compliance. And the Treasurer and Secretary of the Adventist World Church give their reports. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Before we go any further, we would like to take a moment to explain what Annual Council is. Annual Council is one of two annual meetings of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church's Executive Committee. The Executive Committee is the second highest governing body of the denomination. It is second to the delegates of the General Conference in session, which takes place every five years. The Executive Committee is comprised of officers from the World Headquarters, Department Directors, and leaders from the 13 World Territories and other attached fields. Members also include Union Presidents and Presidents of the General Conference Institution. The Committee is also comprised of three lay members from each of the 13 World Territories and one pastor from each territory. It includes one additional frontline employee for every 500,000 members and between 30 and 40 members at large. During annual council, members of the committee commonly referred to as delegates vote on policies and reports that are necessary for the operation of the church. Following more than five hours of presentations and discussion, delegates to the Seventh-day Adventist Church's annual meeting of its full executive committee approved a recommendation from the church's Unity Oversight Committee. The recommendation created a new compliance process to assist with the need to implement church policies and voted actions. The action expressed in a vote of 185 to 124, with two abstaining, approved the document entitled Regard for and Practice of General Conference Session and General Conference Executive Committee Actions. The decision was an extension of a vote by the General Conference Executive Committee at its October 2017 meeting. That action referred an earlier proposal made in 2017 by the same Unity Oversight Committee back for further study. The document outlines a process for addressing matters of noncompliance within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In summary, the process begins with perceived noncompliance being reported to the administrative level of the church closest to the matter. The document emphasized the need for Christian due process, including prayer and dialogue and a supportive atmosphere. As part of the process, the non-compliant entity would be asked to provide evidence of compliance or a plan to achieve sustained compliance. If no resolution is reached at the closest administrative levels, the General Conference Administrative Committee, or ADCOM, may refer the matter to one of the five advisory committees. These committees, termed Compliance Committees, had earlier been endorsed by ADCOM. And after studying the matter, the Compliance Committee may make recommendations to ADCOM for disciplinary measures. ADCOM may then refer the recommendations on to General Conference Division Officers Committee and the Executive Committee. The document next outlines a process of appeal as well as disciplinary measures. These disciplinary measures may only be voted by the Executive Committee and may include official warnings and public reprimands. In the event of persistent noncompliance, potential removal from Executive Committee membership by a two-thirds majority vote is allowed according to the bylaws of the General Conference Constitution. The afternoon session began with Ted N. C. Wilson, president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who chaired the afternoon session, reminding attendees the origins of the document come from you. It's your document. It's in your hands. It is not my document. Wilson clarified there would be no recommendations coming from the compliance committees at this year's annual council meeting. Wilson then asked for all to participate with a sweet spirit and a Christ-like demeanor. We want a very open kind of setting. We want to move ahead with an open and gracious spirit. We are here to do the will of the Lord. Chair of the Unity Oversight Committee, Michael Ryan, introduced the history of the document with presentations made by David Trim, Director of Archives, Statistics, and Research, Karnik Dumetsian, Lead Counsel for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and Hensley Marubin, Adventist World Church Undersecretary. Ryan moved the adoption of the document and Marubin subsequently read the document aloud. 71 delegates and invitees lined up five microphones to address the proposed document. Wilson expressed appreciation to the executive committee members for the good spirit exhibited during the afternoon. I am extraordinarily impressed with your patience. I also want to express my deep appreciation to you as a body as to the way you have spoken. That speaks volumes. Wilson concluded, as we leave here tonight, let us leave united in shedding light on all those who need to know about Christ's soon return. You can read the full news story at news.adventist.org. Seventh-day Adventist Church takes the use of church monies very seriously. 
said General Conference Treasurer Juan Prestor Poisson in presenting the Treasury report. Prestor Poisson's report, which opened the business sessions of the 2018 Annual Council, shared some of the ways the church ensures a careful managing of its funds. Prestor Poisson said that so far this year, the church has been blessed with a 9% increase in tithe from the North American vision. It has also experienced increases from other countries around the world. Financial objectives of the current church administration continue to be clear, said Prestor Poisson. They include operating on a balanced budget, maintaining adequate levels of liquidity and working capital to honor the obligations of the world field, and providing a meaningful support service to the regions and programs that interact with the General Conference. Other objectives Prestor Poisson mentioned include continuing allocations for operational efficiencies and maintaining a high level of quality training for treasurers around the world. He also pledged to keep working in cooperation with other departments to achieve even better efficiency. Another important recommendation in the financial report involved continually enforcing the accountability for the use of tithe. One final recommendation deals with the use and allocation of the 2020 General Conference Session offering. The recommendation refers to an item on the Annual Council agenda, which recommended to designate the special offering for the one-year admission program. It was reported that detailed guidelines for the use of funds will be prepared by General Conference Youth Ministries with input from Presidential, Secretariat, and Treasury. Reflecting on the challenges of the financial management of church funds, Prestor Poisson quoted a statement of church co-founder Ellen G. White. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us that we know nothing about. He concluded by thanking the many supportive leaders and treasurers around the world that facilitate the work of the church and by sharing his unwavering confidence in God's leading. Prestor Poisson devoted considerable time of his report to provide clarification about the use of an extraordinary tithe, a term used to designate sizable tithe returns given under special circumstances. Prestor Poisson's financial report briefly rehearsed the history of this extraordinary tithe. Extraordinary tithe is a term used to designate sizable tithe returns given under special circumstances. In this case, in early 2007, church leaders were notified by an Adventist family of its intention to sell the assets of their international businesses. The family had committed to faithfully return the tithe on the profits of the sale as they were realized. Pastor Poisson explained the amount was extraordinarily large. There was wide consultation about where to return the tithe. Local conference and union leaders, officers of the Adventist Church in North America, and world church leaders were contacted to discuss the best approach to receiving the funds. The consensus within the church was that those tithe funds should be remitted directly to the General Conference. As part of his financial report to this year's Executive Committee, the World Church Treasurer next shared a timetable of actions, which affirmed the policy variance while keeping church leaders and delegates informed. The spring meeting of the General Conference Executive Committee in 2008 confirmed the decision. Additionally, a separate operating fund was set up for those funds, and detailed reports made available on a monthly basis to all General Conference Executive Committee members. And finally, a detailed report regarding the activity of the fund was voted by delegates as part of the financial report at both the 2010 and 2015 General Conference sessions. The disbursements have been received by the General Conference Treasury, and most have been applied to various parts of the world for kingdom-building activities and projects, as well as to the General Conference initiatives. Pastor Poisson made clear that those funds have not been used for the general operations of the General Conference or any other entity. To read the full article, visit news.adventist.org. The 2018 Secretary's Report to the Annual Council's Executive Committee focused on mission and reaching out to the world. G.T. Ng, Secretary of the Adventist World Church, said, This is our marching orders of the church. He said to spread all over the world to proclaim the three angels' messages. We caught the vision in the early days, right here in Battle Creek. Following his introduction of the Secretary's report, Ng introduced Gary Krause, Director of Adventist Mission. Krause highlighted several entities that make up the mission family at the General Conference. During his report, Kraus highlighted Adventist Mission's many initiatives, including its Total Employment Tent Makers program. Total employment allows people to seek job opportunities in their field, in challenging places, to engage their communities and share the love of Jesus. Attendees were introduced to Dragoslava Santrak, the new managing editor of the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventist Project. According to Santrak, articles will be released on ESDA online starting early next year, with a desire that all divisions and unions are equally represented. 
In his statistical report, David Trim, director of the Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research, shared that the Adventist Church has now reached a little more than 21 million members, with latest figures as of June 30, 2018. Trim said, if we look at the total number over the last 20 years, you can see very steady growth to such an extent that the worldwide ratio for Adventists to the population is now at 361 people for every Seventh-day Adventist globally. Coming up, the first textbook on Adventist mission is released. But up next, a new app allows you to search for mission opportunities in your own field all around the world. Do you see unexpected visitors on this black sand beach? Here comes one now. Green sea turtles usually spend their lives swimming, except when laying eggs. Why crawl onto this beach? Probably because there are no predators to bother them, and the black sand warms their bodies. This haven gives them comfort and rest from the constant labor of swimming to stay alive. Do you ever feel that you must constantly work? God has given us a haven in time, the Sabbath. That's why we are celebrating Creation Sabbath on October 27, a day when all creation can rest, enjoy the wonderful world God made for us, and look forward to the even better new creation He has promised. Welcome back. To help facilitate mission opportunities, the Adventist Church released Vivid Faith, a new app networking organizations needing help with people interested in serving. Italo Osorio, the architect of Vivid Faith, asked committee members to focus on the future of this new tool that makes it easier to connect missionaries with service opportunities. As an app available for anyone to download and use, Vivid Faith will be a way for people to observe, understand, and experience the Adventist lifestyle and also join the church. While not all users will meet the criteria for mission assignments, they can read about experiences, browse through assignments, and vicariously experience mission service. Vivid Faith will include more than student missionary and long-term international service employee openings. For example, Vivid Faith will have opportunities that can be done remotely, such as creating a website for an entity in another country, volunteering in a school for an hour every week, and group projects that include serving non-Adventists in the community. Ted N.C. Wilson, president of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church, highlighted the need for using technology in mission. Referring to Vivid Faith, he said, the more opportunities we have to serve and share our faith, the brighter and clearer people will see Jesus reflected in each one of us. When the app launches, it is hoped that there will be at least 100 opportunities listed from all across this globe. For more information, visit vividfaith.org. During the last segment of the Secretary's Report, Institute of World Mission Director Cheryl Doss, along with representatives from the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University, introduced a brand new missions textbook titled Introduction to Adventist Mission. The Institute of World Mission team was tasked with creating a missions textbook for schools or anyone, for that matter, who is interested in learning more about mission work. They partnered with the Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University to produce the manual. Kiri Moscala, Dean of the Seminary at Andrews University, enthusiastically presented Introduction to Adventist Mission, the very first, first textbook for Adventist Mission, written over a three-year period by seminary professor Gordon R. Doss. Wilson offered a prayer of dedication, asking that the Lord would use the results of this book to the further expansion of the Adventist Mission around the world. The Seventh-day Adventist Church unveiled a five-year strategic plan called I Will Go and approved an updated mission statement that aims to more closely reflect the wording of Jesus' Great Commission. The draft strategy pursues many goals of the current five-year plan, reach the world, but simplifies the plan while retaining its sharp focus on spreading the gospel and nurturing church members. It will be voted on at 2019 Annual Council and, if approved, be implemented from the 2020 General Conference session. 
The six-page I Will Go plan contains 10 objectives compared to 21 objectives in Reach the World. The 10 objectives start with a call to revive the concept of worldwide mission and sacrifice for mission as a way of life involving not only pastors, every church member, young and old, in a journey of discipleship. Other objectives are to strengthen Adventist outreach in large cities and to prioritize the development of resources for mission to non-Christian religions and belief systems. The plan's name, I Will Go, came from Argentina's River Plate Adventist University, whose mission program has the same name. The university gave permission for use of the name and its program's student-designed logo. Annual Council delegates also approved the revision of the Adventist Church's mission statement to read, Make disciples of Jesus Christ who live as His loving witnesses and proclaim to all people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation for His soon return. Matthew 28, 18, 20, Acts 1, 8, and Revelations 14, 6 to 12. The previous statement read, The mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to call all people to become disciples of Jesus Christ, to proclaim the everlasting gospel embraced by the three angels' message, Revelations 14, 6 to 12, and to prepare the world for Christ's soon return. Artis Deli, a general vice president of the General Conference who introduced the updated statement, said the wording is meant to more precisely reflect the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and to incorporate the missional ideas of Acts 1-8 and the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Steli also said an easy-to-remember mission statement was sought, and he considers the result to be a success. This isn't the end of our 2018 annual council updates. At the time of this recording, the 2018 fall meeting of the church's executive committee is still in progress. Next week, we'll report on the Leadership, Education, and Development Conference, or LEAD conference, that was held prior to the annual council's meetings. We'll also be able to report on a special announcement from Special Needs Ministries. You won't want to miss it, so make sure you tune in next week. Coming up, have you ever wanted to attend the GAIN conference? Registration for 2019 is open, and Emily has more information. But up next, Adventist Mission has a story about a very special school in Thailand. We may look, pray, read, think, worship, sing, and share differently, but we all look forward to the Sabbath. And we all look forward to the future when Jesus will come again. With this message in mind, we arrived at a core component for a new identity system, the creation grid, a simple seven column structure for layout. The grid is a reference both to the prophetic timeline as well as to the creation week that culminated in the seventh day Sabbath. The first six columns of the grid belong to the designer. They can be filled with anything, text, images, illustrations, patterns, and logos. But the seventh column, the Sabbath column, does not belong to them. It is meant to be different and special. Regardless of what or where you are designing, you can always find information to help you communicate that we are all Seventh-day Adventists. May I work in with you, young fella? Yeah. Go for it. That's the way you do it. Gotta put a little weight on it. But I'll put it back up here for you. Welcome back. In Karat, Thailand, an Adventist international school is known for teaching students good values. But why are some parents hesitant to send their kids there? An Adventist mission has more. <laughs> right now I'm in grade 8. I'm in grade 2. I am in grade 5. I am in grade 9 right now and I've been here since grade 1. My favorite subject would be uh, science. My favorite subject is art. Yeah, we learn um, um, like coding and stuff. Coding and typing. Help us to type faster. School began because parents in Karat were looking for an international school that could help their children with English primarily. 
and they knew about the Seventh-day Adventist system. So they came and asked us to start a school here in Karat. Well, you know that we started with 16 children. We only have these two classrooms here. This school is here to let them know about Jesus Christ. One thing that really impressed me about the students were they were so eager to learn, not only English, but they were so eager to learn so many things, especially Bible. Every day they demand me to tell stories about the Bible. This school teaches the Bible, and I like the Bible. I come to know more about Jesus, and then I started to believe in Jesus here. Yeah. We, I have learned many things. Uh, we always read the Bible in the morning, pray to Him. As a teacher, I'm, I'm trying my best to be a good example. So my contribution is that is introducing God to these young generations, young leaders of Thailand. So my hope and prayer is that they will not forget what they learned and wherever they will go later, they will always remember Jesus and accept Jesus in their hearts. <laughs> everything, everything that we do here. This school might be small, but everyone here is friends and we are all friends with each other, so it's like a nice small community. We play together, we help each other. And be kind and share. Because the parents feel that we are giving their children values, working hard to build good characters for them, I would ask for the world community, the church community, to pray that those values will be very effective and that they will be of a tremendous benefit to the Thai community. My daughter is more of a leader than before. Now she can explain herself. She can do more than before. I feel like I have become more responsible. This school is like pretty small and I want a bigger school so that we can have places to play and study. Well, we are growing and it's really not enough now. We are struggling. Uh, right now we are sharing a classroom with the teachers. The idea of an international school in Thailand is that it is a very nice place for students to go. The facilities are nice. Our parents understand that we teach good values. But when their friends look at our school, they see something that is not representative of an international school. Some of their friends don't want to send their children to our school because of the facilities not being represented. We would like a new facility because yeah, we are getting bigger and we need some place to hold us. I feel very happy that we will be getting a new building. We will have more for supporting our school. Not only to support the school, if we support the school, it means we are supporting the children. Ames Karat is very special. And I know that God started this school, and I believe that He handpicked each student to be here. And He wants them saved. <laughs> so for me, um, until Jesus comes, this will continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
In partnership with the Avenus Development and Relief Agency, we will give Avenus communicators the opportunity to use their talents and skills to participate in a global advocacy campaign for education. Participants will also be able to use the tools learned at this year's GAIN and apply them to their own campaigns and workflow at home. In addition to the GAIN meetings, there will also be a new summit and multiple GAIN workshops, including digital marketing, storytelling, and crisis management. There will also be tours to Mount Nebo, Bethany, the Dead Sea, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Petra. Early registration will end on October 31, and late registration closes on November 15. Visit gain.avenus.org for more information and to register. You can also find more information on Facebook and Twitter at GainCon. Follow along with the hashtag Gain19. You can contact the organizers with any questions by emailing gain at gc.avenus.org. We're excited to see you there. And finally for today's episode, let's turn to Alejandra Castillo for a look at Adventist history. This week, the Pitcairn made its first voyage from Oakland, California. Hello and welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On October 20th, 1890, the schooner or sailing ship named Pitcairn set sail from Oakland, California on its maiden voyage across the Pacific Ocean with several Adventist missionaries on board. The vessel was used by Seventh-day Adventists for transporting missionaries across the Pacific Ocean over the next 10 years. The ship is probably the best known of Seventh-day Adventist missionary vessels. The decision to build a missionary ship was made at the General Conference Session of October 1889, and construction began soon after. The ship was paid for in part by Sabbath school offerings. While the vessel would originally be named Glad Tidings, on further consideration, the Foreign Mission Board settled on the name Pitcairn. M.C. Wilcox, who was present at the Pitcairn's dedication, described the schooner as follows. The length of the ship is 100 feet, breadth of beam 27 feet, depth of hold 10 feet, and it is of about 120 tons burden. It is made out of the very best timber, and the workmanship is of the best character. The ship has two masts, foremast and mainmast, each 79 feet long. She is capable of spreading to the breeze 1,576 square yards of canvas. The ship, completed in the fall of 1890, cost a total of $22,098 by the time it was completed and furnished. The Pitcairn made a total of six voyages in the South Pacific in the 1890s, carrying missionaries to the Society Islands, Cook Islands, Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji. That was this day in Adventist history. Thanks for watching a and Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your feedback and tell us how your church is making a difference in its community. Be sure to capture plenty of video footage and photos and then write up a summary of the event's important details. And feel free to send full video reports as well. You can reach us by sending an email to annvideo11 at gmail.com. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. As it says, so let's do it, full of belief, confident that we're presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. Let us see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.